my new opening, whatever they call it, slide. Best sung to the tune of uh, Sheldon Cooper's Soft Kitty. Tough Kitty, Cold Kitty, Big Machine of Doom, Deadly Kitty, Panzer Kitty, Boom, Boom, Boom. All right. I'm inspired because I'm going to deal with some ignorance and stupidity right off the bat. I'm going to talk about Gary Khan. I'm going to talk about the perception that Gary Khan is becoming an elitist convention or only old school or, all right. Now I've tracked down where this comes from, and it comes from several people on the forums that have decided that they are the arbiters of Gary Khan. And they're creating us a, a smell around Gary Khan that people are taking it if you are to believe them we're some sort of elitist snobby convention that only plays old school games which is a crock of crap and it's the last thing we would do if we were there truly to remember Gary because Gary liked to play everything and anything and we, you're welcome to play everything and anything there now, I'm talking about Gary Khan, and I'm also going to speak on behalf of Gary Khan this evening because I spoke with a couple of the people that run the, the big show, and I know that they'll back up what I'm going to say. The stuff on the forums is just people nattering on. That's all it is. Unless you see something on one of those forums that says it's from an administrator, and those are always carefully marked. Blue or purple, like something like that. And as you see it from an administrator, it's just somebody rambling and running off their mouth. Now, these individuals seem to think that Gary Khan should be preserved as a sanctuary for old school gaming. Now, there's something here about this old school that is um, a really wicked. It's not even a double-edged word. It's a triple or it's like a four-headed broad arrow, broad, broad head. One of those razors you kill things with because they go through and slice everything up. People go on there and they talk about, they want people to believe that Gary Khan is only about the OSR. Now, these, this is that OSR, that capital O, capital S, capital R, the old school revival, the old school renaissance. The term has been hacked and beaten and pummeled and pulled and stretched out of shape for the last 10 years so badly. What does it mean anymore? It's really just kind of a philosophy of, hey, let's have fun and the rules aren't all that important and we're just here to have a good time and make new friends and see old friends and Let's just do that. Now, capital O, capital S, capital R, the old school revival or the old school renaissance was a movement several years ago. Now, when called out on their um, protestations about it, they, uh, several of the people that were being yammering fools, uh, cited advertising from Gary Khan's two, three, four, five, whatever, that said that, yeah, this is Gary Khan. Welcome. We're here. Uh, this is an old school gaming convention. It was small O, small S, with a dash in the middle, meaning, hey, we're here to remember the old Gen Cons. We're here to remember the old cons we used to have in Lake Geneva. It doesn't mean that we're some strict elitist thing that you can only play old school games. Bull. Anybody that hears this, anybody that hears that this, you can't point them here to this video. Because I'm telling you, you can. We welcome everything. The Wizards have been, been uh, you know, real involved. There's lots of new, new games and companies becoming involved. Um, I happen to know that the dealer hall for next Gary Khan is already filled and assigned. And um, don't listen to those nattering fools. 
come play what you want to play. If you want to run something, submit it. The best way to tell if you submitted the wrong game is if nobody shows up. And then it's like, okay, people in this area or at this con don't play this game or don't know about this game. So sometimes when that happens, you just go grab Dragoon four or five people sitting around in the hallway doing nothing. Say, hey, come on, I want to teach you this new game. My game didn't work out, but I want to show some people how this game goes. You know, I've done that a couple, three times over the years. And it always works out for fun. So um, don't listen to these self-proclaimed prophets, these self-anointed uh, uh, gatekeepers. We don't have any gatekeepers. Gary Khan doesn't have any gatekeepers. That's the way it is. Okay, got a number of interesting things to talk about tonight. Besides all that, let's see, where do we want to start? Well, um, let's see. How about somebody wanted to know? I saw <laughs> my favorite source of entertainment. I found it on a Facebook thread. It's becoming a trite cliche, but it happens. Why were there no witches in 1E? Well, you know, as a class, as a class. Well, let's take a little, let's go get into the Wayback Machine, oh, shall we? With um, Poindexter and uh, the dog. And um, and I'll think of his name halfway through this later. And uh, we'll go back to 19, late 70s. We had started to get kickback, feedback, pushback from some religious groups. I've told the story earlier about the group in, up way up in the Minnesota that destroyed all their stuff. And then of course their local distributor doubled their order the next time it came through and the kids bought it all and hit it again. And I've heard stories like that, seen stories like that before. So we were already getting some of that stuff. And then if you don't know why the uh, Satanism thing in the in the 80s wasn't such a big thing to TSR, it's because we'd already been through it once. Look up the name James Dallas Egbert III, or just Dallas Egbert, or Dallas Egbert III. 1979, he went missing in the steam tunnels at the university. And they hired some hot shot bullshit Texas private dick who walked around with six shooters on his hips and steps and hats. And um, anyway, the rumor was that he was lost in the steam tunnels under the university playing Dungeons and Dragons. And that, that, that big glare, that big spotlight brought all the loonies out of the woodwork. Oh, the poor boy, he's been deluded and, and deceived and let down, and now he's dead. And blah, 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 blah. Well, he wasn't dead, and he didn't die. Wasn't it at all. And the story that most of the public got was bullshit. Because I did a little investigating on my own and talked to people up there, and um, the, 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 the cowboy private detective spun the story to make himself look good, and then he wrote a book that was half crap. But anyway, Dallas Egbert III, that started the devil worshippers, the Satanists. We'd already had a problem with the, uh, not only the cover of Eldritch Wizardry, but the content. Because we're getting into more spells and more magic and stuff like this. And so um, people are starting to notice this. And um, the... The old uh, smart aleck response about if you think this is real, try spending the gold, began to pall a little bit. It wasn't as effective. So we'd already had a dry run for the Satan crap that came in the 80s in the late 70s. We'd already been there and done that. Pardon me. It got so bad for a while when Egbert, well, I've told the Egbert story before. You go find it on another one of my, one of my videos. I don't really want to tell that whole story again um 
but uh, lost in the steam tunnels started the whole first um, backlash against D and D because of the devils and the demons and all that. And look where it went. Uh, we did not make witch as a player class for an extremely good reason. When the characters, the books came out, 74, 75, think about it. You have to think of the vernacular, how the word was used, what the thinking was then. Okay, as a history teacher, that's what you have to do. If you use the word wizard, well, you were a pinball wizard or you were, you know, it was, it was, it was not taken seriously, the word wizard. They, we, people didn't really believe there was guys out there being wizards and doing wizardly things. The word witch, however, has a much deeper meaning. It's a more fundamental meaning. It's something that we're probably exposed to one way or another when we're youngsters, when we're children. Whether it's a, a, a Grimm's fairy tale or Snow White or that scary old lady that lived at the end of the block in the dark house that had the big dog. You know, uh, when you were a kid, you, of course, she was a witch. She had to be a witch, okay? And while we giggled and laughed at them as kids, we were still whistling in the dark. It wasn't but 200 years ago, we were burning girls in, in, in um, uh, uh, Massachusetts because they were dancing around the fires at night because they'd had some uh, basically uh, ergot-laden rye, which is a... Uh, it's like an acid trip. Let's all go party around the maypole. Um, so um, we were very sensitive to the fact that that was not a player class that we were going to introduce at that time. And it was not even an NPC that we really spent much time on. The word still had a powerful, evocative image. And we were not complete and total fools. We steered away from things. Okay. We would never have, never, ever have gone anywhere near what vile things demons and devils are purported to have done. That again, those were, if, those demon devil, that's something that's ingrained in us in our youth. And is every, when you say devil, to have 100 people in the room, if they could instantly sketch what they see in their mind, you get get 100 varying drawings of somebody with horns and a tail, more than likely, but they'd be varying. So we didn't do witches in 1E because it was just asking for trouble. Who needs it? We're having too much fun anyway, and, and the bumps that we'd already found in the road... We didn't feel like we needed to add any more. Um, we never said that a druid couldn't be female. Never said that. Never said a wizard or a magic user. If you recall, we called them magic users. Didn't say it couldn't be a female. And no, I don't believe that if we'd had witches as a player class, that it would have attracted more females. Again, because of the image, that mind's eye picture. When you get witch, what do you see? I see the woman with the long nose and the warts on it from, from uh, uh, Snow White. Uh, I see uh, Maleficent. Okay? I, you, I, you, don't, you don't need to. Everybody has that image in there. So um, there were a lot of things. We never said you couldn't be a female fighter. Though, yeah, there was a lot of crap about females couldn't be as strong. Yeah, da, 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 da. Well, you know, that was trying to stick too much to realism, which eventually was realized, <laughs> screw it all. It's just fantasy anyway. So, uh, you know, screw realism. We don't need realism. We're not, we're not realistic. We're, fanta we're fantasy. We're fantastic. Um, so... Um, that's pretty much, that's why we didn't do witches. It would have been a very economically bad move. It would have given more, it would have been just like sending a grenade 
to every religious group that wanted to get on our case and then driving down the street and letting them lob grenades at us. Not a real good idea unless you're inside a really big tank. Even then, they might get lucky. Um, so that's why it wasn't such a big thing. I wasn't there for the big one, but I was there when for the first one when it all began, and we <laughs> learned a few things. Um, let's see what else I have on my list. Okay, a couple other things um, tonight. And you're going to have to indulge me here. Somebody asked me, is there a cheat sheet for setting up a Tim Cass game or a Tim Cass campaign? Uh, I never wrote one, but I'll tell you how I go about it. And this is going to just be a long, interesting uh, wrap here. So um, if you want to uh, quick pause this and run and get a drink or, you know, light a smoke or whatever, uh, go right ahead and do that. First off, this is how I build this is how I would construct a group around which I would then construct a campaign. And around which is an important philosophy. First off, I decide what level of the player is going to be. Are we going to start them all out at ones? Going to use an average die? Start them out, you know, twos, threes, fours, maybe even five. You know, one chance of two, one chance of a five, two threes, two fours. We used to do that when we were restarting characters, you know, early in a campaign and where they wouldn't be quite so far behind that way. Um, so anyway, decide what are you going to design this for? Because you got to design commensurate to what you want your group to do. Unless you're playing with experienced players who know better than to run off and immediately try to fight the wyvern as second level players uh, instead of going doing the easy jobs and you know buffing up so to speak because that's what we did a lot of was buffing up so anyway okay I got a I got a okay I got the levels that I want to go so now I'm going to design a dungeon um, because it's always easy to start on a crawl uh, and then when you come out then you can you know go do do different things so I started out and I figure out, you know, com rewards commensurate with the risk. Now, if I got a bunch of third and fourth level players, uh, putting in a whole lot of goblins isn't a big deal. Putting in a bunch of trolls is. Okay, that's not fair. It's, it, it, fairness, I know I almost used the word there myself. It, it's not I'm not even sure the word. It's, I hate the idea of being, having to do something like uh, the wizards were doing there for a while with some of their adventures, but it's just silly to put everything in there that they don't have a snowball's chance in hell against. Now, you can always put in some tough stuff as long as you give them a way around it or you give it a weak spot or an Achilles heel, or something like that, because you want to have fun. It's really not fun croaking off all your players in the second hour or the first time you sit down. Especially if you spend an hour rolling all those characters up, that would really suck. <coughs> so you come up, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you come up with uh, commensurate rewards. And... Um, however many sessions of gaming it takes to, you know, make that crawl through the dungeon or, or to get, get across country to uh, find the next uh, whatever. And that's another thing. I had, uh, I had lots of outdoor involvement in my campaigns. So anyway, you make up a dungeon. They have some success because, you know, everybody wants to have some success. And, uh, okay, they're coming up out of the dungeon. Now is the DM. I'm going to find a village <clears throat> that uh, just happens to be a, a short distance away. Uh, could even be the one they started from. Doesn't really matter because once the hook is set on the backstory, the rest, what really happened, really doesn't have anything to do with it. So you give them a village, and they'll tell you what there needs to be in the village. If they're all beat up, uh, then, you know, having a cleric there to drain off some of their loot 
to heal them back up is a good idea because you don't want too much money floating around the campaign. My campaigns were known for being priced like something from the 1860s, you know, a steak dinner, uh, and, and, and you know, for uh, 50 cents, uh, five silvers. Um, you know, something I, I, mine was very uninflated, um, very uninflated. <laughs> And uh, it worked better that way. For one thing, you weren't giving out enormous stuff that you, amounts of, of, of metal that you needed a donkey to carry. And um, it was also easier to keep track of. And I never adhered to the experience points for gold find. That was crap. From the very beginning, Gary and I argued about it uh, constantly because if I devised a, a, a horde and they somehow managed to defeat the dragon that I had uh, guarding it because they insisted on going and following this rumor or this legend. Um, well, I was a game buster. So I kept cheap games. And so then now you as the DM, what are you going to do? Here's your guys. You saw how they, well, they, they, they did or didn't prevail in the first adventure you game. I and mean, it shouldn't have been too tough and it shouldn't have been real rewarding either, but it should serve as a, uh, shakedown crews for your for your band of murder hobos. They should figure out how they work together, and and uh, uh, leaders will begin to emerge, and the idea people will begin to emerge, and a campaign should develop somewhat organically from there. Now you can take somebody else's world, uh, Stefan Bacorny's Valoria. Um, um, you could take. Um, the Greyhawk, whatever. And you could start somewhere in a wilderness in an area of the map that was not developed by the developers. It's easy. And then let them find their way out into the map. If you want to if you want to play a prescripted one or if you want to use some uh, prepared maps and then uh, change the, the details and on the ins on the stuff on the maps to your own, that's all cool. Nobody expects you to be a cartographer like uh, Alyssa McFadden, who's <laughs> we've all seen what she can do on Facebook. Um, if we could all do that, she wouldn't have a job. Um, and you go from there. Now, that's how you get the ball rolling. How do you play it? Well, you don't let the rules get in the way. Just don't. Um yeah, I cheat sometimes. I don't cheat the players. If this were an adversarial me versus the players, I cheat myself. Sometimes it would just be a no, just not not the right thing to happen. Um, and that could be because they got stupidly lucky and and got Jove to come down and throw a cosmic thunderbolt and kill you, <laughs> or something horrendous happens to them and despite all their best efforts um, on some chart somewhere they gotta die that's why I don't really rely on I don't rely on other people's charts and that I figure um, I know what their odds should be and um, I don't raise them I don't lower them sometimes I'm astonished when something that I thought would be a pretty simple obstacle stumps them for a couple of hours and then, and then they turn around and they trash two levels of dungeon in three so uh, you just don't know what's going to happen and you got to be ready to play loosey-goosey and by the seat of your pants and make shit up as you go you don't have to make it all up but you can't ever uh, show indecision and again now we're not this isn't adversarial but if you show indecision, you're in the risk of the mood being broken because you guys are all creating a story together. Now, guys is a unisex and all your preferences and genders and whatever. That's what I'm using here. You're developing the story. That's why I'm not real big on using prepared campaign maps. Uh, or if I do, then I just pretty much ignore a lot of what's been prepared for the map, and I do it up myself. Or I take what's been prepared for the map, and I change it around, and I tweak with it, and I, 
I, I tweak it, I tinker with it. Um, but to, to run a Tim Cask old school, as the question was written, as asked, um, you just got to be willing to go with the flow, make stuff up as it happens. And I don't mean make up monsters on the spot, but um, somebody says, hey, I think I'm going to try this. Well, just pick a, you know, pick a number out of your head that seems logical about whether or not it's likely to happen. And go with it. Um, the 20-sided die is the greatest tool for the DM. Because you can pick a number. It's like pick a number 1 to 20. And they got to roll and pick a number. And if they, you know, if they beat it or, you know, however you work it, beat it or, you know, um, get under it, whatever, um, then they succeed. Um, be prepared to laugh if you're going to play in one of my games. My style is to laugh a lot at ourselves, at what's going on, what's happening. We don't get so intense and involved that it's like we come out of a, a rabbit hole after three hours. You know, we've been down the rabbit hole chasing rabbits for three hours. No, we weren't playing bunnies and burrows either. Though I hear there's a new edition of that coming out. Um, and you should try it. It's a great game. Pretty frustrating, though, if you're numbers oriented. Because they know five numbers. Or maybe it's only four. One, two, three, four, and many. Or one, two, three, and many. Um, it, great great fun once in a while though, to play. And, uh, the guy that made it, Dr. Sestari, is a wonderful gentleman. So anyway, that's how you would play. Uh, that That's the cheat sheet or the uh, checklist for my kind of game. is be prepared, be flexible, make stuff up on the fly if you have to. Um if they get to that end of the hall that you hadn't prepared yet, well, today it's got a landslide, or um, today there's a, a gas hanging over it, and doesn't look like a good idea to go into it, or you know, whatever. Just extemporize, find little side adventures. One of your players is looking for some kind of type of magical item set up someplace where they can go try and find it and the whole thing is to overcome obstacles and ex gain experience and become more adept and etc etc but that's the game mechanic main thing the, the real thing is to have fun and if you're not having fun you're not doing it right and you shouldn't go back week after week if you're not having fun and you know having fun doesn't mean winning Good Lord, if that was the case, I would never have my buddies over every other Wednesday night because I hardly ever win. Somebody asked me about old games. Because he is just becoming exposed to some of the old games, being a new gamer himself. There once was a game called Barbarian kingdom and empire it changed hands a couple of times then i think it just kind of dropped off the face of the earth brilliant game revoltingly atrocious record keeping involved if this game had come out 20 years later with computers what a game this would be what a game. Everybody starts out as barbarians. Pretty soon they conquer enough neighbors, they become a kingdom. They conquer enough neighbors, they become an empire, and then they start to ent atrophy. Entropy sets in. And they devolve back to a barbarian, and you start the cycle all over again. Wonderful game. Atrocious. All the moves would be done in 20 minutes. Take another 40 to do the, do the economics. Another great huge game from the old days was, um, oh, nuts. Now I'm trying to remember the name. It was Peloponnesian Wars. And it was an eight, you know, like an eight player game. And it took all day. But it was, it was fun. And uh, it was one of the early multiplayers. I have tons of two players that I like to play, that I enjoy playing. 
but I really enjoy playing multi games, multiplayer games more because I enjoy the friendship and the camaraderie and the fellowship. And oh, I don't know, fellowship. Is that going to work out as a, as a unisex term? Personship, I guess we'll have to start calling it personship. Anyway, I, I, that's what I really, really like. Uh, Barbarian Kingdoms, Empires, uh, let's see. Oh, there was one, there was a board game that we used to play called History of the World. Again, it was a multiplayer game. Two-player games, there's lots of them I like to play, but I, I prefer to play multiplayer games. I played two-player games when I only had one or two other friends that played. When I can play multiplayer games, well, that's why I play the social part of it. The winning part's fun, but it's the striving. I saw a quote by uh, Robert Redford. And this ought to apply to RPGs. And the, the, I'm going to paraphrase here. The quote was something to the effect of, the fun is in the climbing of the mountain. Because once you're on the top, there's nowhere left to go. Well, that's why when we got to 10th or 12th level players, we retired them and we climbed the mountain again because that's where the fun was. Oh, uh, I think I may have run out of things to say already. Good grief. Um, I think I have. Don't believe forums. Those are just people yammering. I do know that Gary Khan is going to publish a uh, statement of purpose again to reiterate that we welcome all kinds of gaming. All forms of gaming are welcome. Heck, if you want to LARP outside in March in Wisconsin, LARP away. Can't do it indoors because of the hotel regulations and stuff. But hey, you, you've seen it. There's all those woods and fields and golf courses and crap to run around. You could go out there and LARP to your heart's content. That's the extreme. <laughs> <coughs> I guess that's all I got. <coughs> Till next week. <coughs> Sorry for this. <coughs> Till next week.